Well, let's talk about Easter a little bit today. You know, uh, in a poll that was done by the Barna Group three years ago, when asked what Easter meant, fewer than half of the respondents had anything to do with Jesus Christ or the resurrection. They had all kinds of other answers, but, but nothing to do with the resurrection. Half of Americans, when they think of Easter, don't think of Jesus. When kids are asked, the overwhelming majority of them think that it's the Easter Bunny's birthday. That's kind of sad, isn't it? Not your kids, I know. But, but, but those other people's kids, they think it's the Easter Bunny's birthday. Wow. And at the same time, uh, reports will say that, that this year we'll probably spend in excess of $13 billion. And it's not just a, a day anymore, it's turned into a month. You know, it's kind of stretching out like what Christmas has done. I've noticed that my junk mail has changed. Um, now I'm told for the last two weeks, somebody's been sending me something, they must know me, uh, because they said if I'll buy this supplement that I can be thin by Easter. That's not true, is it? If I buy this something in my junk mail. And, and a BMW dealer uh, has been sending me that he's got an Easter sale on his BMWs. And that, I guess, since he believes in the resurrection so much, he's just cut all the prices in half of all of his cars. What a dealer that is, right? But it, Easter is changing so much. Things change. Easter is a celebration of the day when everything changed. And that's our theme today. There have been other days when things have changed for many people, but none like this first Easter. Um, a day that changed everything, August 6, 1945, the first atomic bomb was dropped on Hiroshima. 140,000 people died. It changed our world. Those of us that are the, the boomers in the room remember what it was like to grow up and to go through the atomic bomb drills where you had to duck under the desk like that was going to save you from an atomic blast. But the whole world changed. The, the whole arms race came into being. Most of us in the room remember September 11, 2001, uh, a day that has still changed life for all Americans. Every time we fly, every time we see a report on the news, we think of terrorism. But there are probably some other dates um, in our personal lives where things have changed. Um, you may have a date that's more important to you because that's the day maybe when your child was born or, or you were married or... Um, you know, maybe some other big important life event where you achieve something and you remember that day every time it comes around. It, it may be a day that, that maybe is not so happy for you. Um, there may be a day that changed your world because that was the day when you got the diagnosis of the cancer or maybe uh, that's the day when your mom got the diagnosis of her cancer or your, your father was killed or, or something else. Strange how... You know, we kind of go through life uh, day by day and week by week and uh, year by year, and it all kind of just blends together. Then all of a sudden, one day changes things, doesn't it? And then what we do is we go, well, let's see, when was that? Oh, I, that, was, that was before John was born. It's funny how it just kind of uh, marks life, these signposts, but we do have different times in life when uh, days when, when life changes there's a day in history that's the single most important day of change, a day that's recognized by over half the world as the most important day in history. It's a day when Jesus Christ was raised from the dead. Uh, we call it Resurrection Day. And I want to just talk to us a few minutes about that. Uh, first, let's read one of the scriptures uh, from Matthew 28, 1 through 10. Uh, Matthew says, After the Sabbath... At dawn on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary came to look at the tomb. Look, there was a great earthquake, for an angel of the Lord came down from heaven. Coming to the stone, he rolled it away and sat on it. Now his face was like lightning and his clothes as white as snow. The guards were so terrified of him that they shook with fear and became like dead men. But the angel said to the, to the women, Don't be afraid. I know that you are looking for Jesus who was crucified. He isn't here because he's been raised from the dead, just as he said, come see the place where they laid him. Now hurry, go and tell his disciples he's been raised from the dead. He's going on ahead of you to Galilee. You will see him there. I've given the message to you. 
With great fear and excitement, they hurried away from the tomb and ran to tell his disciples. But Jesus met them and greeted them. They came and grabbed his feet and worshipped him. Then Jesus said to them, Don't be afraid. Go and tell my brothers that I'm going to Galilee. They will see me there. The account of the resurrection is in all four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John in the New Testament, and it's true that there are some variations. Um, don't want to hide that from anybody. This time of year, you know, you'll see some of these shows on the History Channel or on National Geographic, and they're usually shows that kind of try to debunk some of this stuff. Or maybe you took a class in college on world religions, and uh, oftentimes in college what they will do is the professor will, will try to give you more information so you realize that there's some, there's some great deal of, of difference in, in what went on here. Uh, Bible critics will do that, and they'll say, well, just throw the whole thing out. None of them are accurate. And yet, if you stop and think about it, there's four Gospels, and they differ on some things like how many women were there, uh, when they went, how many angels were at the tomb. Some have one, some have two. And if you were going to create a religion, which is like what some of the skeptics say is what happened, is that Paul and some others created Christianity to take over the world. It's not going so well, but, but that's what they said happened. Would you uh, have variations in your four accounts? As a matter of fact, when people investigate something and they have eyewitnesses, if the eyewitnesses tell exactly down to every detail uh, the same story, that's one of the indications that there's been collusion and that they've gotten together and said, what are we going to say? But what we find is some variation, but the main things are consistent across all four Gospels. Um, Jesus died by crucifixion late Friday afternoon. Uh, the Jewish day began at evening instead of sunrise. It began, or midnight like ours does, it began at sunrise or sundown, excuse me. So the next day was a Sabbath. On the Sabbath, the Jews could not touch a, a dead body. So Jesus died, we think, about 3 o'clock on Friday afternoon, and they just had a few hours to get him down from the cross, to cleanse the body, to get him in a borrowed tomb. And, and all the accounts say that a man came forward, loaned his tomb to that. Um, they rolled a big stone in front of it uh, so they could begin the Sabbath, and there were some guards that were placed there, some Roman guards. Jesus has said that he would uh, rise in three days, and the Jewish authorities were concerned about that, that the disciples would come and steal his body away. So they put some Roman guards. And then the next important fact is that early on Sunday morning, uh, some women went to the tomb to finish taking care of the body. And they had some spices to, to go and to take care of this body of Jesus. And when they arrived at the tomb, the stone was already rolled away. There was an angel that was there who said, uh, he is not here, he's risen, go and tell. And the Roman guards in the, in the accounts are lying on the ground just um, in shock. I mean, it says like dead men, they passed out from this event. And so the women leave and go and tell others, and the Gospels all agree that the news of the resurrection did not immediately change anything. I mean, this is something that you might miss, Jesus and his resurrected body walks the earth for 40 days after this. And he teaches them and he equips them for what's going to take place next. Uh, slowly the reality would sink in that the world had changed and the world would never be the same. In each of the accounts, all four Gospels, the other reality of the resurrection is reported is that there's unbelief by everybody. Nobody goes, oh, I knew this was going to happen. Yeah, I've been waiting for this. Exactly the opposite. They're told, some of them even see, but they don't believe it. Uh, no one expected it. Um, the, the women, they're faithful, but they're not going there to see the resurrection. They're going there to take care of the dead body. And all their worlds and all their hopes had been smashed, and they had had one of those life-changing Fridays, you see, when Jesus, this one that they had hoped in, was tortured and killed and died, and they're in shock. I can understand that. I, you probably can too. If you all had somebody that died suddenly, you know, maybe a classmate dies in a car wreck, 
or maybe a close family member that just suddenly dies. And it, it takes a long time for that to absorb into you what's happened. Um, you're in shock. Uh, usually what happens in that when someone dies suddenly is you wake up the next day and you, you, you think just, just for a second, was all of that a dream? Was yesterday a, a bad dream? Is this reality? And that's where the disciples are. Uh, they're, they're completely in shock. And they had thought that Jesus was going to um, be made king and that he would overthrow the Romans and that Israel would rise to be this great nation again. They all doubted the resurrection. As a matter of fact, Mark ends his gospel. Um, the, the first ending of Mark's gospel says that the women who went and tell the other did not go to tell the others because they were so afraid. They were told to go tell, and Mark ends his gospels and says that the women just said they're afraid and they're not telling anybody. Then later on, they tell some people, but the disciples don't believe the women. Nobody believes. Everybody has unbelief. And these are the people that write the story down that were in the story. You'd think they'd try to paint themselves in a better light, but this is what's real. It's when a day changes your world like this, it's not really easy to believe. You come to it slow. You just can't take it in. Jesus told them many times uh, what would happen. He told them quite plainly that he would be arrested in Jerusalem, that he would be put on trial, that he would be tortured, that he would die, but in three days he would rise again. Now that's just so plain. And remember he said that unless a grain of wheat falls into the dirt and dies, it remains by itself alone. But if it dies, it will bear much fruit. And that was God's plan. It was just death and resurrection. And he told them so many times, and they just can't take it in. Now, we'd be a lot smarter than that. I mean, these are just, right, primitive, uh, sarcasm alert, primitive, uneducated people. We being so educated, we would, we would do better than this. We would be waiting for the resurrection. We would be down there on Sunday morning with our lawn chairs set around the tomb, right? And CNN and, and Fox News would have their satellite all set up and, and you know, they'd have, they'd have the place roped off. The celebrities would be in the front and the rest of us would be behind them, right? And just waiting for this thing to happen. Maybe, you know, a few hot dog vendors, kosher hot dogs, yeah. <laughs> Hebrew national, right? Maybe, maybe a t-shirt guy, you know, I went to the resurrection, all I got was this lousy t-shirt. <laughs> Something you can take home with you, right? These primitive people. We think we would be ready. We think we would act on what he said, but we wouldn't have been because... Have you ever thought about this, that the resurrection is the greatest miracle that's happened since creation? Since the creation of the world, the resurrection of Jesus Christ is the greatest miracle. And, you know, sometimes people wrestle with things like, I don't know if I can believe that Jesus walked on water. Um, I don't know if I can believe that he raised Lazarus from the dead. I don't know if I can believe that God parted the Dead Sea. Listen, if you believe the resurrection, all the rest of that stuff's just pretty small stuff, really. Resurrection is huge. This is the greatest miracle since creation. But, you know... Uh, for many of us who affirm the resurrection of Jesus Christ, the resurrection doesn't make much difference in life. Uh, I'm sorry to say that, but that's just kind of how we roll, you know. Uh, we go day by day, but um, yeah, yeah, Easter, it's important, but the rest of the day, is, is the resurrection really something that we think about? I'm sad to say it's true. We're often like the disciples, still kind of huddled, you know, away in rooms and, and kind of out of fear and not really grasping this, that the whole world has changed the way things are. And we say, well, yeah, yeah, I believe that Jesus rose from the dead, and I think that's what my church believes. I know that's true, so that's really important. And that's not a world-changing event kind of statement. That may be important, but, you know, that doesn't change my world. When we look at the resurrection... The, the, the biggest proof for the resurrection, I think, is the lives of these 11 guys. Uh, you know, the 12 minus Judas. These 11 guys and what, the, what it did to them. Because all 11 of them 
come from being people of unbelief that are hiding someplace up in some room somewhere to being 11 guys who, with the exception of one of them, die, die for the resurrection. This is so huge in their life. Everything changed for them. And they, they go from being people who are afraid. You know, Peter denies Jesus three times. After the resurrection, the Jews threaten him. They say, you know, if, if you don't shape up, Peter, and shut up, the same thing's going to happen to you as what happened to Jesus. Well, you can't talk in the name of Jesus anymore. Peter says, I've got to do what God wants me to do. He turns into this man of courage. And it's because of the Holy Spirit and the resurrection. It was a day that changed his life. The resurrection of Jesus Christ is not just world changing and relevant unless it changes my world. And often takes us a while for that to happen. It always begins in an instant, the, the moment that the Holy Spirit begins to stir in our hearts. We begin to just kind of, you know, question as to whether this might be true or not. That's where it starts, but it takes much longer. There's a phrase in the New Testament that appears 91 times. I think it's extremely important because it, it tries to relate this reality of, of how the resurrection impacts our life. The phrase is in Christ. If When you're reading the Bible, you'll see this over and over and you'll just pass right over it. It just says in Christ, in Christ. The, the Greek preposition that's used here, translated as in, uh, has a lot of uh, possible meanings. I'm looking at a Greek scholar in the back, and I'll look the other way in case he gets a bad look on his face. Like a, He's got to be quiet. He can't say it while I'm preaching, right? But uh, in could also is also translated other places as into. There, there are a lot of possibilities. I, I like hearing that I'm living into Christ. It's got, it's got action in it. It's got life in it. And when you say I'm living in Christ, sounds like something that happened one time when I was 12 years old, right? And I've been hanging on ever since then. But, but this is different to live into Christ. Paul and the other writers used to describe what life is like when, when we get the resurrection, that we're living daily into Christ. Just one example. Here's Romans 6, 8 to 11. He says, if we died with Christ, we have faith that we will also live with him. I'll just pause and let that sink in for a minute. If we died with Christ, have you died with Christ? We have faith that we will also live with Him. We know that Christ Jesus, we know that Christ has been raised from the dead. There's a resurrection and He will never die again. Death no longer holds power over Him. He died to sin once and for all with His death, but He lives for God with His life in the same way you also should consider yourselves dead to sin, but alive for God in Christ Jesus. That's how you're living, in Christ Jesus. There's so much in those four verses, I'm not going to go through them, but, but just catch that phrase about the resurrection. It says that since we know that Christ has been raised from the dead and He will never die again. And I mean, that's the core of everything, right? We know, He's, Paul says, we know. And, and you know, quite honestly, uh, if you're like me, it's like some days I know and some days I, I hope. And, and some days I know and some days I think. And Paul says, we know that he rose from the dead. Wow, to, to stand in that, we know that he's alive. You don't get there in a moment. You don't move from living as if you're all on your own and you're just trying to sort out life on your own to living over here to living into Christ where my life lives towards him every day. And it's a conditional statement. It says, if we have died with Christ, that's how he begins the whole statement. Now, we could, we could use a whole bunch of theology here and talk about what it means to die into Christ. But we have to come to the point in my relationship with Jesus, who is alive, that, that he is more important than everything else. That's dying to all my wants and desires and ideas is to, is to, to really die to myself. If you've been married long, uh, you know what it is to die. Um, <laughs> pause there for a moment. That'll wake you up. That'll wake you up. All right. Sorry, honey. So that you can have life. All right. Please don't edit that out. If you've been married long, you know what it is to die so that you can have life. 
Um, your husband loves basketball, okay? And you know that if you want to talk to your husband from November till uh, April, most years in Kentucky, um, <laughs> just part of Kentucky, uh, that you're not going to see much when there's a basketball game on because he's going to be watching basketball. And, and you like home and garden TV, and you're probably going to have two TVs and go in the other room and watch home and garden TV while he's there watching anybody that's got a round ball that's running up and down the court. He's a fan of everybody, right? That's what it is to be a guy and love basketball. So what are you going to do? You're going to say, uh, if I'm going to live into my marriage, all right, into my husband, then I'm going to learn to like basketball. <laughs> guys are loving me right now, right? It goes the other way around. I mean, uh, guys, if you want to uh, live into marriage with your wife, you're going to have to learn how to watch Home and Garden TV, right? Come on, right? Yeah, of course. See, we could flip that both ways. Maybe your wife loves Indian food and you like Mexican Guys don't like Indian food, usually quite like, you know, it's just kind of weird, you know, and you usually have to go home right afterwards, enough said. But, <laughs> but, 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 you know, if, if you're going to go out to dinner and, and, and she says, where do you want to go tonight? What are you going to say? I love Indian food, honey. If you're going to live into marriage, you see, if you're going to live into your wife, does this help with living in Christ? I hope it does. I mean, he likes Indian food and Mexican. You can go to the place with him. But if you're going to live in, into him, if you're going to live into Jesus, then it means that you die to some of your old things, right? So that you can learn to love and develop this new taste for what he loves. That's what we do. That's how we learn how to, you know, the wife develops a taste for basketball. The husband develops a taste for home garden TV. Those two are pretty simple, but I think you get the idea. You die to yourself to live into someone else. You give up life alone so you can have a life together that's much better. And your tastes change. That's what happens to Christians. They die to their old likes and they develop a whole new set of likes. See, they're living into Christ. Now, we do this in a lot of different things. We live into a lot of things that, that are going to happen in the future. Some of us are living into retirement. Some of us are living into vacation that's going to happen in two weeks. And that's all you're thinking about. Some of us are living into that new job. We're living into that new house. We're living into that new child. This just dominates our thinking. You know where I'm going. You know how this, how this is. We've all got something that we're living into. What if we lived into Jesus that way? What if we lived into Christ so that the resurrection was so real that it just dominates us. This is what it means to live into him. We know that he's alive and we seek him. I said a few weeks ago that, you know, we talk about asking Jesus into our hearts. And I think it's really more important that we live into him. You know, I, I'm not I'm not bashing that. I'm just saying that it doesn't stop there. You know, we, we need to live into his life because he's always in the future. It's a world changer. In fact, the Bible says over and over that when that happens, that you're going to have a new life. Listen to this, 2 Corinthians 5, 17. We can't let the day go without quoting this. He says, so then, if anyone is in Christ, now you know what that means, right? That person is part of the new creation. The old things have gone away, and look, new things have arrived. You get a new life. <laughs> I learned that passage 35 years ago, and it still thrills me today. Because there's always, every day, some of my old life that I'm trying to get rid of. I'm always finding some vestiges of that packed into my day. Okay, and I'm trying to get rid of this garbage. And it's funny how you can't do it all in one moment. You can't do it all in one week. It, it takes a long time. The more that we live into Christ, the more we're willing to give up our demands and our rights and our desires and Mexican food and basketball. Uh, Aren't you ready to get rid of the past? I'm always ready to get rid of the past. We must be willing to die to it. Now, as we close here, I, I want to give us just a, a few questions to chew on as we close. Um, those of you that are here know I like to do this. I, I like to take things home with me to chew on for a while. Are you ready for a change? Hmm. Here's a question for you. 
if life continues on the way it is right now for you, are you happy about that? Or would you be happy if nothing changed in your life from now on? Boy, I can't imagine anyone saying that. There's usually something that needs to change, right? Are you ready for that change? I'm talking about how, how the, the world changed in one moment. Are you ready for that change? And here, here's the second one. Do you live like Jesus is alive? You know, be quite honest with you, I have brief moments where I do. I do not consistently live like Jesus is alive. I've never known anyone that lived every moment like Jesus was alive. To live like Jesus is alive is to have no fear. It's to live like dead men and women. It's to live like we've got nothing to lose, right? Like the, the creator of the universe is on our side and he wants to give us what the best things in life. No guilt. Do we live like Jesus is alive? This could be, this could be your Easter. This, this may be the 40th, 50th Easter of yours. I don't know, but this could be your Easter. This could be the day when everything begins to change. This could be the day that you look back and say, yeah, I remember. That was, that was after March 31st, 2013, because that's the day that things change for me. This could be that day for you. I don't know. You know, I, I always think that I know what's going on in everybody's life. We pastors just kind of arrogantly think that we know that. But I don't really know what's going on in your life. I know that if you reach out to God, that God is always there. That if you search for Him, He says, with all of your heart, He says, I will be found. I will be found if you search for me with all your heart. Let's take some time and sit in prayer with those questions. As deep cries out 